Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, a message to the country from a hospital bed. I thought I could handle it. And I was so gravely wrong, oh my God. As COVID cases hit new highs in several provinces, the stories of the people behind the statistics and the pleas from doctors for more help now. Also tonight, clean up after wild homecoming parties take over streets around Canadian universities. They were trying to tear this uh, traffic barrier. They saw people carrying street signs. Students do some serious damage. Is it a COVID risk too? An international investigation reveals the shadowy world of offshore tax havens. The people that could end the secrecy of offshore are themselves benefiting from it. Where the rich, famous and powerful funnel their money, including some Canadian athletes. And after a record-breaking season, bidding farewell to the boys of summer. Fly ball, left center, goal! This is The National. Across Canada right now, as families look forward to Thanksgiving, some may be wondering if their gatherings next weekend will bring COVID into their homes. Those big dinners and the colder weather could push the fourth wave even higher. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, average daily new cases have stabilized. Hospitals there, as you'll see, likely can't absorb another surge. But let's begin in New Brunswick, still in the midst of an alarming growth of infections. That has already led to a record number of patients in ICUs and rising COVID deaths, including this weekend a man in his 30s. Kayla Hounsell tells us his story in a province facing more tragedy as the pandemic worsens. Trent Anderson was 39 years old, healthy with no underlying conditions, a Fredericton firefighter who enjoyed sharing that passion with his stepson. He chose that job because he wanted to... Uh help people and just show his, his love and his big heart. Anderson received his first dose of COVID-19 vaccine just days before he got sick. His family says his condition deteriorated rapidly. He was put on a ventilator and died Friday. They were going to let me come see him, but then they called and said I wouldn't have time to get there. And they let me FaceTime. I got to tell him that I loved him, but I don't know if he heard me. His was one of four deaths reported yesterday, as well as 140 new cases, the worst single-day numbers since the pandemic began. We need people to stay within their 20 close contacts per household. That is really important right now in terms of getting our numbers down. The Chief Medical Officer of Health says worship events accounted for 10% of the province's cases in September. This weekend, public safety officers conducted spot checks at churches to ensure public health protocols were being followed. Russell couldn't say whether any were fined. That pastor used this disease as a way to uh, test people's faith in the Lord. Joe G believes a local church he won't name played a role in multiple members of his family contracting the virus. If you want to make this a thing of religion, why not, why not tell people that, that the Lord has already answered our prayers by giving us brains and by giving us science? His father died shortly after he gave this interview. A reminder that COVID can take devastating aim, even in a part of the country that had fared relatively well for most of the pandemic. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Despite the rising challenge in New Brunswick, nearly 70% of Canada's COVID patients are in British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Yvette Brenton shows us the burden of that fourth wave on hospitals and people. I never thought I would be a statistic. I thought I could handle it. And I was so gravely wrong. Oh my God. Charlena Merrill, a mother of two, told Rosemary Barton Live she avoided getting vaccinated because of the fear of side effects. Because of all the information out there and the risks on both sides. Take your time. Take your time. No rush at all. I just couldn't make up my mind. A mural is out of the ICU, but many are not as fortunate. There are stories like hers across the West. Here's Bobby. Hi, buddy. 
In Alberta, Tatiana Rideout says she planned to get vaccinated after giving birth, but got COVID symptoms as she was going into labour and had to deliver her baby by C-section without her partner. I chose not to get vaccinated because I wasn't even allowed to eat sushi. I was told when I was pregnant not to even have Advil. I'm not going to take this vaccine because I don't know what it would do to the baby. Canada's Vaccine Advisory Committee recommends vaccination for pregnant and breastfeeding women. There are more than a thousand people with COVID in Alberta's hospitals. The Canadian Armed Forces are soon sending critical care nurses into the province to help. In neighbouring Saskatchewan, this ICU doctor says his province is just a few days behind Alberta's COVID trend and heading to the edge. The situation in Saskatchewan is, uh, could only be described as a situation that is out of control and that the healthcare system at the brink of a major collapse where everybody vaccinated or not will feel the brunt of it. Oh, they're so nice. In Vancouver, healthcare workers were greeted this weekend with 700 thank you cards hand drawn by students. But the help that they need most is to get those who refuse to vaccinate protected so they stay out of the ICU. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. And that BC mother you saw in Yvette's story, Charlene Amaro, appeared on Rosemary Barton Live because she wanted to deliver a specific message that took all her strength. I'm just so thankful to be alive, though, but it's going to be a battle to come back from. Oh. We, we can stop whenever you want, but, but what would you say to people, Charlene, because this is why you wanted to talk to me. There are people still not vaccinated in this country. Some people, because they just, they're not sure. What would you say to them? Well, you don't know how you're going to react to COVID if it gets, if you catch it. And it's, it's so evil that you need any type of protection you can from this. And, you know, there's risks. You got to do everything you can to protect yourself and make the right decision for yourself and your family. Well, from that poignant plea to a change in policy, some provinces are expanding their mask mandates for school aged children to try to curb transmission. Starting tomorrow, students from kindergarten to grade three in BC will have to wear a mask. And in Quebec, masks will be required in gym class when physical distancing isn't possible. They'll also be mandatory for preschool students who take the bus with students from other grades. Well, let's bring in Dr. Fatima Kakar now, a pediatric infectious disease specialist in Montreal. And Dr. Kakar, in terms of what you're seeing at your hospital, in your practice, uh, what's different this fall when it comes to, to young kids and COVID? So unfortunately, we're seeing larger numbers of children with COVID. So outbreaks in schools and in daycares. And what's that res that? resulting in increasing numbers of hospitalizations. And again, most kids are fine, but there are severe cases that we are seeing with Delta. So overall, increasing outbreaks, increasing numbers, and increasing hospitalized kids. So that's unfortunate, but if there's some glimmer of optimism, I guess it may come from vaccinations. We learned over the weekend that Pfizer submitted preliminary data to Health Canada for its vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds. What comes next? So this is really exciting because it means that within the next month or so, we should have hopefully Health Canada approval and then the different provincial committees will be meeting to decide and to really look at the risk benefit data um, and the pure data from Pfizer to really plan vaccine rollout in the different provinces. So I think we're looking in a best case scenario for about a month until approval and then rollout plans and implementation plans. So mid to end November. Dr. Kakar, always nice to have you on the program. Thank you so much. This is homecoming season at many Canadian universities, typically a time when alumni and students gather on campus. This year, though, like last, the pandemic led to a lot of events getting cancelled. But as Tally Ricci shows us, this weekend, some students decided to party anyway, and that turned destructive. Chaos in one Ottawa neighborhood Saturday night after thousands of people flooded the streets following a football game between the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. <laughs> Property was damaged, public health rules blatantly ignored, and seven people were sent to hospital. Quite a scene for this man who moved in just last week. 
I sat out on my porch pretty much all night, just keeping an eye on things, trying to keep people from going up my driveway. They were trying to tear this uh, traffic barrier that's kind of flexible for emergency vehicles off. I saw people carrying street signs, so yeah, clearly there was a little more chaos than just the car. Ottawa police are now investigating. Quite frankly, the university has to step up as well. The fact of the matter is this uh, certainly gives a black eye to the university and to certain students who showed complete poor judgment. Both universities have condemned the party. The University of Ottawa says it will work with police and the city to make sure this doesn't happen again. In Hamilton, a similar story. Police estimate 5,000 people gathered to party this weekend. A car was flipped there too. People are now raising money to help replace it. When it comes to things like damaging property, and potentially causing harm to, to others. That's, that's where it crosses a, a big line there. Parties aren't new, he says, but this level of destruction is. One doctor says a year and a half of pandemic restrictions may have played a role. I think there may be, you know, their inconsiderate and insensitive behavior is a reflection of the uh, tremendous stress that they've gone through. But could these parties make the COVID situation worse? Dr. Suman Chakrabarty says he doesn't condone them, but he's not too worried. I think the big thing for us to remember is that in these situations where you're going to have the vast majority, if not all of the students fully vaccinated and it's outdoors, I think the risk is not zero, but it's substantially reduced. Navigating these situations is just another pandemic challenge for schools and students. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. A woman who hired two B.C. real estate agents to sell her house says they drugged and sexually assaulted her. But instead of pursuing criminal charges, she's suing them, saying she feels that's more likely to hold her alleged attackers accountable. Erica Johnson has this Go Public investigation. The sexual assault happened three years ago, she says, but haunts her daily. I would definitely say that I was drugged. CBC is not naming her because she's an alleged victim of sexual assault. Someone else is reading her words. She says she hired two realtors from this agency to sell her house. Bowman Rutledge and Andy Rogers. In a statement of claim just filed, she says they lured her to their office one night, drugged her glass of wine and sexually assaulted her. I just went into a complete trauma response. I tried my best to just kind of put everything away and move forward. But the trauma wreaked havoc, she says, caused PTSD, depression, anxiety. Needing to be heard, she posted her story on this anonymous Instagram account for sexual assault survivors, naming the two accused. Similar accounts have popped up across the country, fueled by the Me Too movement. There's a growing frustration with a lack of accountability that, and it, that leads women and survivors to post these stories on social media. And I think it's an understandable frustration. It's estimated just 5% of sexual assault survivors report to police, and of those cases, few end in a conviction. After being targeted on Instagram, the two realtors were instantly fired from the new agency they'd since moved to. Both responded on social media. I would absolutely never do that to anybody. His colleague said the allegations made against us are untrue and vehemently denied. Neither man has been criminally charged. She did reach out to police last spring, but says that experience was traumatic and she backed away. Still seeking accountability, she eventually decided to sue in civil court. Also a growing trend, says her lawyer, as society better understands the impact of sexual assault on mental health. It has substantial impact on survivors and I think we're seeing more survivors wanting to be compensated for that. Go Public reached out to the two accused men for comment on the lawsuit. Neither responded by deadline. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. If you have a story to share or a tip you'd like Go Public to look into, you can email them directly, gopublic at cbc.ca. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has apologized to a B.C. First Nation for not following up on their invitation to visit. The chief of the Tecumloops to Shwepmec First Nation said she had written to the Prime Minister twice, inviting him to mark the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation with her community near the Kamloops Residential School. Instead, Trudeau flew to Tofino on vacation with his family, a move that has drawn criticism. A senior government source said the Prime Minister apologized to the chief yesterday and looks forward to visiting the site soon. 
This evening, Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald released this statement saying, hollow apologies will no longer be accepted. I expect concrete action and changed behaviors. The Prime Minister must demonstrate through actions that he is committed to the healing path forward. Five years after the Panama Papers exposed the world of offshore tax havens and the wealthy people who use them, a giant leak of documents is revealing that world is still thriving. The documents dubbed the Pandora Papers were obtained by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which includes CBC as a media partner. And as Terence McKenna explains, some famous Canadians appear in the documents. Back in 1994, campaigning to become UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair was categorical in his opposition to offshore tax dodges. Look at the tax system. Offshore trusts get tax relief. Millionaires with the right accountant pay nothing. That was then. This is now. Mr. Blair and his wife Cherie recently used an offshore company based in the British Virgin Islands to purchase an $11 million building in downtown London from another rich government minister's family in Bahrain. It has become the headquarters of Cherie Blair's legal practice and charitable endeavors. The offshore maneuver saved the Blairs over $500,000 in British tax that would have had to be paid if they bought the property directly. That is just one of the revelations in a new release of millions of confidential documents from tax haven law firms that came to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Jared Ryle is the ICIJ director. I guess it mostly demonstrates that the people that could end the secrecy of offshore, could end what's going on, end the criminality, are themselves um, benefiting from it, so there's no incentive for them to end it. Cherie Blair wrote to the ICIJ saying that she and her husband had done nothing illegal and threatened to sue if there was any suggestion that this was corrupt behavior. The transaction was, in fact, legal. The documents include dozens of famous names, from Jordan's King Abdullah to rock star Elton John. The presidents of Ukraine, Kenya, and Ecuador are there, along with the Czech Prime Minister and close associates of Russian President Vladimir Putin, including his reputed latest mistress, Svetlana Krivonogic. Famous Canadian names in the leaked files include race car driver Jacques Villeneuve, who made over a hundred million dollars and streamed money through offshore companies that allowed him to avoid taxes. Through his Montreal law firm, he refused comment. Another surprising case is that of Elvis Stoiko, who received the assistance of Skate Canada to funnel assets worth $6.5 million to a trust in Belize. He says he was acting on the advice of his lawyer, now deceased, and had been assured it was legal. These continuing leaks of confidential financial documents are putting pressure on Western governments to finally do something about it. But so far, they have done almost nothing. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. We'll have more on the Pandora Papers and the secrets they reveal about offshore havens coming up. A Canadian citizen who was a leading figure in ISIS has been charged in the United States. Mohammed Khalifa is accused of conspiring to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization resulting in death. The former Toronto man was originally captured in 2019 and was known as the English Voice of ISIS, responsible for producing and narrating some of the group's most violent propaganda videos. It's alleged he traveled to Syria to join ISIS fighters in 2013. If convicted, he faces life in prison. A round-the-clock operation is underway tonight off the shore of California near Los Angeles, trying to clean up and prevent the further spread of thousands of barrels of crude oil. But as Katie Simpson shows us, it's already had a toxic effect on some wildlife. An ecological disaster off the Southern California coast. Huge oil slicks streak the blue-green waters. Emergency crews are working to contain what damage they can, but the effects are already clear. An oil-covered bird is spotted on the beach, just one of many reports of animals being harmed. In a year that has been filled with incredibly challenging issues, this oil spill constitutes one of the most devastating situations that our community has dealt with in decades. 
Locals reportedly noticed a suspicious smell on Friday night, but it wasn't until Saturday morning that divers discovered a leak at the Beta Field offshore platform, a leak that was finally capped Sunday afternoon after some 3,000 barrels of oil had spilled. We're fully committed to being out here for the until then this incident is fully concluded. Oil made it into the Talbert marshlands, causing significant concern as it is a sensitive environmental area, home to more than 90 different bird species. Local beaches are closed indefinitely as an investigation into the cause gets underway. Residents are being warned to stay away from the toxic globs washing ashore. I was there for a few hours today, and even during that time, I started to feel a little bit of uh, my throat hurt, and, um, and, and you can feel the vapor in the air. One official warned the cleanup could take months, while the impact of this spill could be felt for much longer. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The Blue Jays fought hard for a playoff spot, but they just missed. Fly ball left center. Coming up, the nail-biting end to the Jays' record-breaking season. Plus, more on the investigation into who is using offshore havens, including the king of a country that received hundreds of millions in aid from Canada. People uh, have no jobs, people have no future, and then the king says that it's natural that uh, he is wealthy. No, it's not natural. And one camera operator's drone becomes a crocodile's target. Oh, wow. That was a brand new drone. This is going to be a really hard one to explain to the boss. We're back in a moment. Welcome back. Today, Israel upped the ante for those considered fully vaccinated. The country now requires vaccine passport holders to have a third COVID vaccine shot to qualify. Sasha Petrasik looks at Israel's first in the world tactic to try to contain the fourth wave. Long before other countries had left lockdowns, life in Israel seemed back to normal, thanks to so called green passes for the vaccinated and shots for many early on. So early that experts now fear waning coverage from months ago is fueling a fierce fourth wave of infection now. Israel's solution? A third round of vaccines for everyone over 12, something no other country is recommending, but three and a half million Israelis have already embraced. What is important to us is get back to a, a kind of normal life, so as soon as we had the possibility to, to do it, we just, uh, we just did it. The World Health Organization says it's too soon for widespread boosters when much of the globe hasn't had a first shot. But studies of Israel's strategy, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, have shown 11 times deeper protection against COVID. A lot of young people getting disease after two doses. It's good for the young people. While doctors are... Israel's prime minister promoted his plan at the UN. We faced a choice to either drag Israel into yet another set of lockdowns, further harm our economy and society, or double down on vaccines. We chose the latter. Those without the third vaccine won't be able to use green passes without constant testing. Now if you want to go to work, if you want to go outside, you need to do something that you don't want to do. Others worry we don't know enough about the effect of repeated shots. And even Israeli experts can't say if this third vaccine will be the next of many more. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Edmonton Oilers player Josh Archibald has been sidelined indefinitely. Nurse, right at the side of the net, what a goal! Josh Archibald! Archibald developed a heart condition called myocarditis after catching COVID-19 this summer. He had a severe viral infection coming out of the uh, coming out of his quarantine. He tried to skate for a few days and just wasn't feeling right. So we got a bunch of tests done with him. And what the test showed is at some point this summer he'd had COVID. Archibald is one of the few NHL players who remains unvaccinated. 
Bad news for Blue Jays fans today, but what a way to go out. The record-breaking team had fans on the edge of their seats for game after game after finally returning to play in Toronto mid-season. But even after a huge win at home today, the playoff math dashed their wildcard dreams. Thomas Dagla on the team that captured imaginations. Here they come, the boys of summer, primed for fall baseball, or at least making one last push to get there. I'm so proud of this team and, 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 and Toronto, Canada should be proud of this team because of everything we've done. The Jays needing this final win at home plus a loss by another team for Toronto to have any chance of raising another pennant in the rafters. We're biting our nails every night and we love it. On a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you about today's game? 13. Wow! An excruciatingly tight wildcard race makes for an exhilarating finish to the season. The fans loving it. Go Jays, go! Buying up Jays gear at a rate reminiscent of their last real postseason push five years ago. If they can actually get into the playoffs, it means a lot not only for my business, but for every other small business that um, looks to generate some revenue from it. And in this game, the Jays didn't disappoint. Fly ball left center. Gone! Overpowering the Orioles with two home runs by George Springer on their way to a 12-4 win. Toronto scored more homers this season than ever before. But remember, Jays fans had their eyes on four games at one time, a super Sunday to sort out who stays and who goes. Toronto's hopes coming to an end with this. Breaking ball struck him out in a Red Sox. Boston's win means only the Red Sox and Yankees advance. For the Jays, it's over. After a season that saw them play home games at three different ballparks, it's been a year of highs and lows for fans. This final day proved no different. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the national new documents reveal world leaders are hiding their personal fortunes even when their citizens are struggling. Uncovering the scheme used to shelter the fortune of the King of Jordan after his country received billions in international aid. Stay with us. Earlier, we told you about the new leak of millions of documents revealing how the world's rich and famous continue to funnel their money to offshore tax havens. Among the names in the new Pandora Papers, Jordan's King Abdullah, and revelations of a collection of luxury homes abroad. Here again is Terence McKenna with the outrage it could spark in Jordan and here in Canada. <laughs> Canada has always had a close relationship with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and both Liberal and Conservative Prime Ministers have been very friendly with Jordan's King Abdullah. In the last 10 years, Canada has sent over $800 million in aid to Jordan, and the King has expressed his appreciation for that. And on a personal note, uh, Prime Minister, again, uh, a warm thanks to you, your government, the people of Canada for not only what you do for our country, uh, but for our region and the world. For decades, Jordan has been seen as an oasis of stability in the Middle East, even as the country's economy has taken a nosedive in recent years. First because of the 2009 financial meltdown, and now because of the drop in tourism due to the COVID pandemic. Poverty and unemployment are now widespread. There are frequent demonstrations lately against the king and the royal family, and allegations that corruption and nepotism are choking the country. The unrest has led to thousands of arrests. Journalists, teachers, and aid workers have been rounded up, culminating in the infamous house arrest last April of the popular former Crown Prince Hamza, the king's half-brother. He was accused of plotting a coup, but was able to sneak out a cell phone video denying the charges. I am not the person responsible for the breakdown in governance, for the corruption, and for the incompetence. Hamza was apparently released in exchange for a public oath of loyalty to the king. Those alleging that the king is corrupt are receiving new ammunition. 
A new leak of financial documents to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists show that many present and former world leaders have used offshore companies and lax banking rules to hide money, including King Abdullah. The documents reveal a long list of mysterious companies registered in notorious tax havens like the British Virgin Islands. Those companies own a string of multi-million dollar properties in London, England, a sprawling luxurious apartment in Washington, D.C., and a stunning massive $68 million complex of mansions now under reconstruction on the coast of California. Confidential emails concerning these companies and properties took great care to conceal the identity of the true owner, sometimes referred to as you-know-who. After a great deal of digging, one file in a Panamanian law firm revealed the true beneficial owner, last name Al Hussein, first and middle names Abdullah Al Sharif, residing at the Ragadan Palace in Amman. There is even a copy of the king's passport and signature dated November 2016. Besma Momani is a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. An expert on the Middle East, she has family in Jordan and believes Jordanians will have a strong reaction to these new revelations about King Abdullah. So they're going to be, I think, really, you know, rightly upset um, to hear about these amounts uh, because they are very much uh, concerned with the fact that the country seems like it's, uh, you know, declining on a number of economic measures. The revelations about the king are the kind of evidence long sought by Jordanian dissidents like Ala al Fasa. He was a physics teacher and journalist who published a critique of the royal family, was arrested and faced execution for illegally attempting to change the constitution. He fled to Sweden, where he now lives. In Jordan, uh, it is widely believed that uh, the king himself is involved uh, in corruption. There is uh, a street dance, a uh, sarcastic street dance. Uh, it is called Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Jordanian called uh, the king Alibaba. Uh, to resemble his uh, corruption and his role in uh, uh, taking over the money and uh, even sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the treasury itself. King Abdullah relied on a mysterious figure to run his offshore companies and cover his tracks. Andrew Evans is a chartered accountant who worked in Saskatchewan, then moved to the Channel Islands where he worked for Price Waterhouse and became a leading expert on funneling money through tax havens. When Mr. Evans sent the King's passport to his Panamanian law firm in 2017, he told them to restrict access to the identity of the individual and not store the passport or the name of the individual on any electronic medium. We tracked down Andrew Evans to a house in the mountains of Switzerland, where he didn't deny his service to the King, but refused to comment on his activities in tax havens like the British Virgin Islands. I, I've got to deal with a client, a former client. I have to deal with BVI because it deals with BVI and I have to deal with Panama and that's going to cost me money. When the International Consortium of Journalists wrote to King Abdullah to confront him with this evidence, he responded that he never took money from international aid projects in Jordan. He claimed that it is natural for famous wealthy people to keep their properties private for reasons of security and safety. It is not natural, as he says. Uh, people um, uh, have no jobs, people have, people have no future, and then the king says that he, it's natural that uh, he is wealthy. No, it's not natural. In his response, King Abdullah claimed that he even used his own money to support charitable endeavors in the country. He takes the, the, the big cake and gives back a very tiny piece of it and says, okay, I am generous, I am giving you. We have the right to ask at the first place, where did he get that money from? In his response, King Abdullah claimed that he always paid foreign taxes due and never broke the laws of any jurisdiction where his companies operated. That appears to be incorrect. The British Virgin Islands BVI is a notorious tax haven but there are corporate laws that require politically exposed persons, such as world leaders, to identify themselves on a questionnaire. When King Abdullah's companies were asked if the beneficial owner was a politically exposed person, the answer given repeatedly was no. 
What effect does it have in the international community and their relations with Jordan? I think for the international donor community to, you know, face a situation where uh, the presumed leader has all this wealth externally um, and still be asked to sort of provide money. So I think it's natural for the international donor community to now be a little skeptical. The Kingdom of Jordan recently passed laws requiring residents to report offshore holdings and bank accounts, but clearly the king does not feel bound by such laws. In perfect irony, he has announced a national prize for companies that promote transparency in their financial affairs. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. A man from Scotland is walking across Canada to raise awareness about deforestation. We've got wilderness here that we don't have in Scotland anymore. It's, we've lost over the last few hundred years. We'll show you how Canadians across the country have turned out to help him out next. Welcome back. If you've driven along the Trans-Canada Highway this summer, you may have come across a red-haired man wearing a kilt walking his dog. Michael Yellowlees of Scotland and Luna left Tofino here in British Columbia back in March, and they've been walking across the country ever since. Nick Purden explains why and shows us the Canadians giving them a helping hand. Hello. How you doing? Good. I have some goodies for you. That's so cool. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you okay. so, so much. So there's water, apples, fruit. That's quite Teresa amazing. Jane Snyder and drove a couple of hundred kilometers along the Trans-Canada Highway to help her newfound hero. Thank you. Thanks. We'll catch up with you. In yeah, the yeah, keep following us along on Facebook. Sure. I think it's Make just brilliant, it. and I'm just inspired by him choosing Canada <laughs> to, to walk across. That'd be beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thank Love you. you. <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> Come on in, girl. This is the effect Michael Yellowlees and his dog Luna have on people as they walk across Canada. That's a good girl. Hey? They left British Columbia back in March, and thousands of kilometers later, and on his third pair of shoes, Michael is in Ontario. The walk itself has been amazing. You know, Canada is such a beautiful country in so many ways. You know, you're walking 40, 40, 50 kilometers every day. We're living on an adventure of a lifetime. Michael and Luna are walking across Canada to raise money for a charity called Trees for Life. So far, they've raised around $25,000. The money is to replant the forests in the highlands of Scotland, where Michael is from. So why is he in Canada? We've got wilderness here that we don't have in Scotland anymore. It's, we've lost over the last few hundred years. Um, so coming out and experiencing uh, your landscapes, your wilderness, you know, just the other night, I'm hearing wolves howling. And for me, that's like a bucket list moment. You know, that was, that was like spine tingling um, and something that I really hope that Scotland will have in the future. Oh, come on over, one sec. Michael says his journey is also about raising awareness about climate change. That's hit a chord with Canadians along the road like Darla Stewart. There he did. Uh, very well. Do you need anything? <laughs> um, actually, some water would be lovely, actually. Some water so for you, the dog? Yeah, that would be gorgeous. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. You're an absolute star, Darla. There you go, Luna. How did you hear about this? I, this morning, was going through Facebook and seen a picture of somebody had a picture of you and they were coming through Mattawa. Okay. So they said you were headed this way, so I thought Mattawa by today should be here. Nice. So I thought, okay, we'll watch. Keep, keep an eye out for yes, me. Yes, we did. That's gorgeous. That's so cool. So you know where you're going tonight? Um, I'm not entirely sure where I'm going to camp tonight. Uh, Michael can't stick around. He needs to keep going. But by stopping in, he's already made Darla's day. Very proud and very blessed that there are people out there that will do this and the courage for them to go out and do it. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> okay, girl, we're off. <laughs> okay, good girl, come on in. Good girl, that's a good girl. A few hours later, another day is coming to an end. Michael says he didn't make it as far as he wanted to, but he and Luna are exhausted. And sometimes, on nights like this, they just crash any old place near the highway. There you go. There you go. You think of the giving up all the time. All, all the way across, you have moments of going, oh, I don't know if I can do this, you know, like, uh, especially early on when you have such a long road ahead of you. There's always these doubts and 
You dream about giving up. Luna, come here, girl. Hey. After a few hours rest, Michael and Luna are back on the road, committed to walking another 40 kilometers, one step at a time. So how are you doing? Yeah, we're doing not bad. Getting there today, a little bit, little bit tired today. You've gone more than halfway now across Canada. We have, yeah, yeah. I think uh, something about 4,500 kilometers. So, you know, I guess the question is, how do you keep going? Like today you're tired, how do you keep going? You try and think of the simple things of it, you know, I'm literally just out taking my dog for a walk. Does she help to keep you going? Oh, absolutely, yeah, she's the one pulling us along. That's a good girl, isn't it? She's keeping me moving. And um, the, the mornings where I'm lying in bed, just sort of wanting to give up. She's the one looking me in the face and telling me, like, come on, let's get moving. And then go. Luna may be Michael's secret weapon, but it's clear the Canadians he meets along the highway keep him going, too. Hey, man. Hey, guys, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, we brought you some stuff. We've seen you and your dog there. Yeah, so legend, brother. We thought we'd bring you some stuff there, Guys, buddy. thank you so much. That's very, very appreciated. Yeah. Hey, brother, how's it going? Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, good, mate, good. You didn't eat anything, eh? We're doing pretty well, yeah. Like, yeah. people have been helping us out loads along the road, you know. I'll give you a ton. Nice. Because I've got yeah. army friends all along the way. Lovely, and lovely, as lovely. soon as I say, you know, I know you, and you'll have a place to stay. I love it. I love Nancy Rose drove out to meet Michael and Luna. With the climate crisis, it's like we do need to actually grab it and hold it as our own problem. Like we can blame the government, we can blame whoever, but until we start sort of going, okay, well, we need to change this. That's right. And doing stuff. As they talk, I realize the impact Michael's message has on some people along the highway. Thank you very much. It's great energy. I feel your energy. It's beautiful. Well, light, light, light. I think when you have a good cause, something that speaks to our human nature, to our hearts, to our, our roots, it can't help but bring people together. And I think nature is, is a matter of the heart. And someone like Michael can bring all of these people together, no matter what side they're on. Lots of love to you, okay. Take uh, care. Speak soon. Lots, Lots of love. love. Convincing people that something needs to be done about climate change is a big part of Michael's journey, because he knows that walking and raising money isn't enough. Watch the wind under your kill. <laughs> We've got a long road ahead of us to fix things and get things back in balance. We can't give up. This is the future of the planet, of ourselves, you know, that, so we can't give up. Nick Purden, CBC News, along the Trans-Canada Highway. An Australian videographer was documenting crocodiles when this happened. There goes his drone. What happened next? Right after this. If you have ever wondered what it would look like to be caught in the jaws of a giant crocodile and dragged underwater, well, you're looking at it. Luckily, it was just a drone caught in those jaws, and also, lucky for us, its Australian operator was able to salvage the incredible video. The story of how he got it is our moment. We got the drone up over a small lagoon at Crocodiles Park, and all the crocs were really skittish. But there was one crocodile in particular that was holding its ground and really eyeballing that drone. I thought, great, I'll use this fellow. He's in a stationary spot. I can uh, get some decent shots of him. I lined the drone up and moved over the top of him. And as I was doing that, I looked up towards the lagoon and saw a crocodile vertical out of the water and heard the great clamping noise of a crocodile's jaws coming together. And looked down at my controller and sure enough, it was blank screen and no connection. I thought, oh wow, that was a brand new drone. This is gonna be a really hard one to explain to the boss. This is the drone in question. The way we got this drone back was because a crocodile went and fished it out. And uh, luckily for me at the ABC, we've got some very clever technicians. They managed to retrieve the footage. Unbelievable. We've been sitting here talking about wondering how high that vertical leap was. And also that that crocodile kind of lived out the fantasy of many people who have seen the Google Street View car go by. Have you had that experience? 
would be a nice way to react. That is the National for October 3rd. Good night.